Welcome to Fall Rise Give, a space where we invite you to dig into the real cause of your suffering. Looking at opportunities for growth with a change in your beliefs, thoughts, and actions so you can be your true self and be inspired. Join us as we explore life's ups and downs and navigate the twists and turns, sharing stories of resilience, hope, and the transformative power of giving back. Whether you're looking for a change, in recovery, or simply seeking inspiration, this podcast is your go-to for candid conversations, raw emotions, and a whole lot of heart. Tune in and discover how to fall, rise, and give back on life's extraordinary journey. Welcome to another edition of Fall Rise Give. I'm one of your hosts, Bartender Bob. That's Kumar. And Kumar, we brought in a special guest this week. Uh, it's it's a buddy of yours, Rob. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Rob? Yeah, so Rob was actually um, in the first attitude adjustment meeting that I was in. And I showed up last October, I think it was. And um, I didn't know how long the attitude adjustment meetings were. They were I thought they were 30 minutes. I left at 30 minutes and Rob thought I scared them or they scared me uh, because there were a lot of talk about God. And uh, he still tells that story. And so Rob and I have gotten to know each other. I've seen him in person a couple of times now and uh, lives on the coast of Oregon and I just love the place and love the guy. I love his philosophy on life, his, his attitude, the way of thinking uh, very deep. When I first uh, was on the plane coming back from Chicago, Last year, thinking about the book and the podcast, um, I was chatting with him um, and telling him about what I was going to do and uh, been kind of a mentor of mine as well. So I uh, really appreciate you having uh, being here today, Rob. So welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, I consider it more of a fellow traveler type dynamic, you know, but thank you for your kind words. Um, I'm just... Uh, uh, yeah, I thought the first time I'm, I, you know, that I saw you on on the screen at that meeting, um, you know, I got sober back in Ohio uh, <laughs> the first time, which was '93, and uh, uh, back there, if somebody was new to the meeting, especially if they're new to the program, we'd make it a first step meeting, and. So I thought we were just kind of flying out there into sort of uh, graduate level AA. Of course, I wanted to sort of stage manage that, I guess. And I was just concerned because I looked up and you weren't there. I was like, shit, we scared him off. And then you came back with a vengeance and uh, been back ever since. And uh, clearly my concerns were misplaced because you, uh, you know, you you talk and you walk your faith and uh I appreciate that. You know, um, it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. And I really uh, treasure your friendship. That's what this whole recovery thing is about. You said that you mentioned that you uh, that you quit for the first time in in, uh, 93. Has your journey to being chemical free? Has that been difficult for you? It's it was difficult for me when at uh, 20 years of uh, of complete abstinence from mood altering, uh, substances. Uh, I found myself standing outside a dispensary in Oregon, having the following conversation. It's legal. I know people that have doctors prescribe it, so it must be medicine. And besides that's not really my problem. And, uh, I always thought like in the first 20 years, uh, which was, all in Ohio. I got sober in Dayton, Ohio, but uh, spent uh, 15 years uh, in Cincinnati, got very involved in that community. Um, uh, so, you know, I always thought during that first 20 years, if if I because uh, I always like to smoke weed, you know, weed and, and alcohol were kind of my main things. Uh, I just thought, you know, if I smoke a joint in the morning, I'm going to be getting mighty thirsty and chasing that with a drink, which was true. But it took like five years for that to happen. And so, you know, they say when when uh, if you've had a period of sobriety and you start drinking again, you sort of pick up right where you left off and. The weed basically kind of took me out. I, I, right from day one, I was smoking weed alcoholically. I mean, I eat cookies alcoholically, uh, you know, so forth and so on. 
But it took a little over five years before I picked up a drink. And my God, within two weeks, I, it was worse than it had ever been. The first time around in 93, I just graduated from college and was unemployable because, uh, well, my eyeballs were yellow. I guess that was kind of a little bit of a giveaway. And I'd been trying to drink myself to death. Uh, But I proved to be resilient at at exactly the wrong time. And uh, so... You know, that was a pretty hard physical bottom. Uh, the second time around, I really only drank for for about six months. So the physical, it, I didn't get to the point of being really super beat up physically, but I would have taken that physical bottom in 93 over the mental, emotional, spiritual bottom that I hit in you know, 2000, 2000, I'm sorry, 2020, 2021. And, um, yeah, so it's been almost four years. I'm a January baby. I'll have four years in January if I make it. And, um, uh, this has been the best, not only the best and, and strongest part of my recovery, it's been the best part of my life. I'm just so grateful to make it back. Was it COVID that kind of pushed you to that edge? I was already out. I mean, 2014, yeah, you know, COVID was going on. I was I was spending a whole lot of time getting hammered and screaming at the TV. Not not very mm-hmm. serene. Uh, so COVID, you know, really when COVID happened, this will show you where my head was at. It's like, uh, <laughs> well, I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, I work in the health care field, and so which has no bearing on what we're talking about here so much. But but I'm thinking in like March of 2020, wow, it must really suck to live in China. And then the next day they canceled the NBA. And I'm kind of like, dude, it's happening here. And then right after that, they like locked things down. And I was like, cool. I loved it, man. That just reflected my inner experience. I was locked down and the whole world was locked down. So that didn't bother me a bit, but actually it did. It just took a while for that to kind of sink in because I always used to say, you know, before I got here the first time, if, uh, you know, if people just leave me alone, it'd be great. (laughs) I think we all think that. (laughs) Then they did. And, (laughs) Yeah, it wasn't so great, you know, and I was just, you know, a big part of this disease in my experience is uh, just getting so isolated. And I'm not a gregarious, extroverted person, Mm -hmm. although AA has kind of brought me out of my shell a little bit. But damn, I was lonely. I, you know, that was part of my denial. If denial and avoidance worked, we would not be sitting here this morning. So I want to kind of circle back to what you had said earlier about how, you know, that it took you five years after smoking weed in order to start drinking again. Is that kind of where the whole day at a time thing comes in with the AA program? Yeah. Where you're just, you know, where it's like, okay, I made it this far and I got to do this. And I mean, is that kind of how that works? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's a really important point. I mean, um, I was at a meeting this morning and thank you for starting late. I, I must really want to be, get sober and stay sober because we had our business meeting at 7 a.m. and a bunch of alcoholics in a business meeting. Well, we don't have <laughs> enough time, but, and then we had the, the, you know, meeting meeting after right. that. And there was a guy, um, who said early on, he just had like really struggled with, uh, just the, cravings and and you know he said if i get up in my head and start having that argument i've already lost and he had this uh like what my sponsor calls a bgo a blinding glimpse of the obvious uh i'm just not going to do it today and the fact that he was able to get through that day it kind of helped him the next day so that's huge i mean it not only in uh you know, in terms of time, but also in terms of just breaking seemingly overwhelming, huge tasks down into manageable Mm -hmm. pieces. 
It's huge. So, and plus, you know, the, when you get right down to it, the only time that we can actually, uh, the only time that we actually exist is in this moment. And for a guy that spent a lot of time running down the past and worrying about the future, that's actually very consoling. Right. So you told us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about what your biggest struggle has been, both as a drunk and as a sober person. Well, as a drunk, just, you know, it's just a miserable life. I mean, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to say that uh, there weren't some good times. Clearly, there were. And, you know, I'm I'm a guy who's uh, pretty attentive to quick fixes, free lunches and shortcuts. And so alcohol, which was the first thing I ever did, I mean, at like age 13, uh, it was like, bam, you know, all of a sudden everything's OK. Right. And uh, so uh, the hardest part was just, uh, you know, just admitting that there's a problem which is, you know, that's something I did for years. You know, I'm a functional alcoholic. I mean, uh, you know, and I'd be sitting in the bar, you know, uh, you know, talking about that. So I had identified the problem, but I just didn't think it was that big of a problem. And I certainly wasn't, at, you know, going to ask anybody for help. But, you know, it, even... Even in my mind, as as delirious as I was, it was clear that I was paying more and more and more and giving away more and more and more to get less and less. I mean, that was diminishing returns in a, you know, in a huge way. So the first part, uh, you know, of it is getting physically sober and asking for the help that is required to do that. Uh, I'm convinced I, you know, even if I could do it by myself, uh, and I'm, I'm personally in my own heart convinced that I can't, uh, even if I could, I wouldn't, you know, I'd be missing out on the best part, which is everything that comes after physical sobriety, which, uh, you know, they call that emotional sobriety. And the way I, I kind of think about it is, you know, there's the 12 steps. And the only place where they mention alcohol is in the first half of the first step. And so after that, it's all about trying to fit into the world and trying to be comfortable in my own skin. Uh, so that's the hard part. And actually, today's a good example of that. Um, I woke up at six and it's like, I don't want to get out of bed. I want to sit here and have some really deep thoughts for a long time. And uh and, you know, sometimes I kind of set things up to sort of fool myself or to motivate myself against my will. And it's like, if I don't show up they're you know, they're not going to have anybody uh, to run the business meeting. I mean, of course, somebody, anybody else could have done that. But, you know, that's kind of where my character defect of pride kind of works towards my advantage. It's like, I, you know, I'm going to go because I made a commitment and I don't want people to think ill of. Me. Right. So that's pretty shallow. But, you know, I, I went and I'm a hell of a lot better off than I was laying in bed. And that's always true. It's like the meetings I don't want to go to are quite often the best ones of all. I find that a lot with just life in general. Like if I if I'm thinking to myself, you know what I yeah. wish, I really don't want to do that. You know, I'm, uh, and then you go ahead and do it. It ends up being like you just said. It ends up being something that is life changing or something that's going to give you an, an adventure that you can talk about at a later date or something like that. You know, you meant you did mention something about being comfortable in your own skin. And I want to ask, I want to ask Kumar first. Are you comfortable in your own skin, Kumar? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really am. Um, I wasn't always, and, um, I was not happy with myself and, um, I was not accepting who I was with my faults or with my, uh, I always wanted more and more and more. And I thought that would give me happiness. Um, not just through this year and a half or whatever time it's been, 
but through the work that I've been doing, um, reading a lot of books and meditating, I think the two biggest things that really help me um, being comfortable in my skin, skin is acceptance of everything as is. I'm happy where I'm at. Um, and that kind of leads into appreciation, um, appreciating others, appreciating myself, appreciating things in life, the smaller things. And so, yeah, um, that drives into a very spiritual thing. You know, there's a conflict between Hinduism and Buddhism, but the Hinduism says, take care of yourself and um, then you can give to others. You can only give what you have. Buddhism says, help others and your needs will be met. And so, yeah, I walk through that line quite a bit, but I think it's a, it's a daily struggle for us to be okay with our, you know, quote unquote disabilities or our um, character defects, as we call it in the AA program. And so, yeah, I'm very comfortable in my skin. I'm certainly not perfect. I'm a work in progress, but I, I am starting to do more and more self-love. We've talked about that in the past, right? Um, right, Bob, about yep. self-work. And sure, sure yeah, enough. Yeah. How about you, Rob? Are you comfortable in your own skin? Quite often. And I'd have to say uh, when I'm not, I know, you know, before it was just a global free floating thing before, you know, in the before times, like when I was a kid and a teenager, um, you know, uh, so even when I'm not these days, I, I, I know I know how to get there. And that's huge, you know, and a big part of that is like. You know, when I don't want to do these things, um, what I'm actually doing is I'm I'm not being there for the next person, you know, and I'm I'm not some kind of a saint or anything like that. But there's, you know, the saying it's one of the one of the many paradoxes or seeming paradoxes in recovery. You can't keep it unless you give it away. And um you know, I'm not just going to the meeting to soak it up. You know, I'm hoping that I'm channeling some of that out to the rest of the, the, the group. And, and so that is kind of the secret. I never realized how much power and how much healing there was in giving. And the most valuable time that I, the most valuable thing that I think any of us have is our time and our mm -hmm. attention. Absolutely. So I'm most comfortable in my own skin when I'm present with other people and also kind of available to myself. You know, I spent a lot of years basically being a stranger to myself. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you stopped drinking the first time in 93. Did you did you attend meetings from 93 till when you had your relapse? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, uh, went to... Uh, um, uh, treatment, which actually proved to be uh, just detox because I had really crappy insurance. <laughs> they just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to, you know, like shake right. apart. And the uh, the counselor, when I was leaving out of there, they had like it was in the hospital. Um, but the counselor, when I was on my way out after four days, uh, said, you know, if you're not heading to a meeting today, you're already fucking up, you know. Right. And so there was fear involved and fear is healthy, but I don't think that's sufficient to keep me sober. Uh, and my plan was, okay, the, the whole reason I was in detox to begin with was because my first wife was giving me a choice. Uh, you know, do you want to live here or do you want to keep doing what you're doing? And since I had like five bucks to last me the rest of my life, I thought I would kind of, you know, um, uh, comply with the letter, but not the spirit of, of her edict, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought, okay, well I'll go get detoxed and I'll go to meetings for six weeks. And that'll look like I really want to do something about this. It'll look good to her. And it was fascinating. I didn't know there was a place on earth where people could speak in entire sentences and paragraphs and not get interrupted. And they were talking about stuff that was like a lot deeper than what I was used to. In fact, at my first meeting, some guy that, uh, you know, had tats on his face and piercings all over and had lost a leg in a motorcycle accident. Uh, 
he he said, you know, when you just scratch right under the surface, I'm just a scared little boy. And I'm like, holy shit, right. you know, that's some deep stuff. And so it's stuff like that that kept me coming back. And the fact that I could listen for the first time or try to listen and learn from other people's experience. I mean, way before six weeks, it's like, man, I'm in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick around. This is interesting. Even though for a long time, I didn't think it was going to work for me. So did guilt overtake your feelings of when you, that first time that you grabbed a drink after you quit? I mean, did the guilt get to you a lot? Because I would think that that would be something for myself, that if I did something for such a long time, that the guilt would be over coming, you know, it'd it'd be difficult to deal with. You know, that's a really good question. And there's kind of a cliche, you know, it's like uh, if you're thinking about picking up a drink or a drug, play the tape through all the way to the end. And the problem was, is I'd like I'd already pawned the tape back, you know. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And what I mean by that was uh, what I have to really watch for and what had happened that led me to going back out was I just I got a huge case of the fuckets, mm-hmm. you know? I mean guilt is one thing and you know it was interesting. I I knew that what I was doing was really messed up, but I just didn't care. And what that really comes down to, it's something deeper, I think, than just guilt which is shame, uh, you know, that I'm not worth, I'm not worthy of these, you know, good things. I'm not worthy of being connected with other people of, of being in my, as right of a mind as I can, you know, be in. So, yeah, there was all of that, but, you know, I was able to kind of reach a detente with that, you know, which was pretty much the effect of the drugs and the alcohol but I couldn't push it down quite far enough. Kumar, I know that we've talked in the past about, you know, people not being worthy and everybody's worthy. I mean, when you're listening, when you're listening to Rob's story, which I'm sure you've heard parts of it before. I mean, how, what does that stir up in you? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing I think is for everybody is there's a need not being met and that need not being met results in disappointment and um, suffering in the sense that, your expectations aren't being met, whatever it is, if it's a relationship or a job or community or whatever that is, um, you know, relationships tend to be the biggest ones. And at some point you just say, fuck it, I'm not going to do this anymore. And then you give up. Um, I've talked a lot about Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book. I think I've talked about a man's search for meaning. He was a psychologist before he went into Auschwitz in the death camps. And in the book that he wrote, Man's Search for Meaning, he said people would give up and then they instead they would trade their food for a bowl of soup, whatever it is, for a cigarette. And that's when he knew they were giving up and going to die next. And so I think that's it. I think you, the will to live or the will to be so dissatisfied. And then there's another book that I love, New Pair of Glasses. Uh, one of the original guys talks about a discontent with God discontent with that higher power how can you allow this how can you be this thing and so this disconnection with a higher power this connection with the god um and kind of being angry about it um leads us down this path um but i think in in rob's case and in my case um i feel we're at such a honest place with ourselves that we're able to look at our thoughts coming in and saying I know what I want and I know what I don't want. And sometimes when I go down the train of what I don't want, I can figure out how to shift my thoughts and my emotions around it, either by going to a meeting, reading a book, listening to music, going for a hike. I know a bunch of activities, a bunch of thought processes, a bunch of patterns that I know how to do. And I can shift my energy and I shift my thoughts. And so um, that's really the exciting part. And I think... Rob and I have read some amazing books. And the other day in a meeting, Rob talked about uh, forgiveness. And um, I'd love to hear that story, um, Rob, what you mentioned about um, the L.A. riots and that little scenario, if you remember what you said about forgiveness. Oh. Um, but, yeah, 
there's some really yeah. crazy things that people think about and how they shift energy for at a global level, not just individual level. Yeah, one of my, uh, you know, I've got a lot of teachers. I mean, you guys are happen to be my teachers right now, but uh, 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 recently deceased uh, uh, Zen Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Han uh, is just one of my all time, you know, go tos. And I actually uh, knew a guy when I got sober in Dayton who was who was a judge. He, and, you know, we used to kid him about being sober as a judge. Uh, and he, he had some DUIs and he got sober and all this and that. And he had uh, pretty severe PTSD. He'd been in Nam like 65 through 67. Uh, and. As a sidebar, he actually married my brother and uh, my sister-in-law. Um, you know, as a judge, they're allowed to do that, I guess. But anyway, he uh, he went with Thich Nhat Hanh to like the first time that American um, veterans went back to Vietnam, and uh, so he's the person who who turned me on to that teacher, and. Some of Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, family had been killed, you know, in the war by American servicemen. And he was able to um, find it in, you know, his practice to forgive that. And not just as a, a sentiment or an intention, but as, a, as an action. And then, um, you know, he also in one of his books talks about uh he was watching the the uh, videotape of Rodney King being beaten um, by the LAPD. And he was able to get to uh, having compassion for the police. I mean, clearly for Rodney King, but also for the police in the sense that if you're doing that kind of stuff, you must really be in hell. You must really be suffering. And then kind of the kicker to the whole thing was when Rodney King went on TV and said, can't we just all get along? So clearly he he, too, was able to come to some some acceptance and some forgiveness that make it all right by any stretch. But that's to me is a powerful. Oh, thing. absolutely. I know that in in uh, episodes in the past, Kumar and I have spoke about forgiveness a lot. And, you know, a lot of times when you just open up your heart and forgive somebody that. I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a big burden taken off your shoulders. I mean, just, just the act of forgiving somebody for something that they've done. So Rob, I want to ask you this. This is, this is the final quote. We usually, we use, we have four questions that we ask every guest and the, you've answered the first three. The, the fourth one is how do you, how do you want to be known? How do you want people to, to know Rob or remember Rob? Oh, wow. I, you know, I've never really, uh, thought about that too much. Uh, you remember when I think it was uh, Tom Sawyer, they thought he drowned and he got the opportunity to go to his right. own funeral. So in a sense, that's kind of what you're asking me to do. Uh, and interestingly enough, my sister, who has had 27 years in the program and who lived in Tuscaloosa for many years, um, she just died in September. Sorry to hear that. And because of this program, I was able to be with her uh, during her final illness, as was my brother, who's got 36 years. And uh, uh, I've been asked to write the eulogy for that. And and so I'm in a sense, your question is is helping me to kind of turn that to myself. And I just like to try to keep that fairly no frills. I mean, I just like to be remembered as somebody who uh, was was present and was there for other people and was willing to help um, and who brought a little bit of joy into the world, you know. To leave the world a better place than I found it. <laughs> I think that's a goal for a lot of us. Yeah, you know, and for a guy who is about as lonely and isolated as a person can be to the extent of uh, at the end of this second, you know, before I came in this time, uh, I literally was 
ready to jump off a, a cliff here about 20 miles south from here into the ocean and start swimming west if I survive that or pick up the phone and call my brother. So I guess a really good epitaph would be he picked up the phone. When I was drinking, the epitaph probably would have been something like, well, it wasn't that bad. So that I guess that's my answer to that question. Kumar, do you have any final thoughts? And I mentioned this before. We are an average of five people that we hang out with. And it could be more than five and, you know, whatever. But people that come into our path have a, have an impact on us. And um, it's the energies and similarities and it's the love that we share. And so anybody listening to the podcast is going to feel that same energy as we are because they're thinking in the same vibration level. And, um, and that kindness and that's compassion. And that's what we're here to do. And so we've all struggled and our struggles are our biggest gifts. And we talked about falling, fall, rise, give, right? And then we rise based on our elevation of our thoughts, really, and then our actions and how we survive it. And then we give it away. And so this podcast was founded on the concept of the 12th step, which is to give it away, right? And so we, we know that true happiness comes when we share with others our gifts and um, when we share to make the world a better place. And so, um, you know, like you said, what you want to be known for, Rob, is the same thing as Bob and I try to do every week. We try to record these things. We try to make the world a better place by sharing stories and sharing uh, insights. And so uh, being present is... There's another uh, book, powerful book called The Power of Now. That's all we got is right now. And so being present is really the key. And that's when we can not worry about the future and not be, you know, holding grudges about the past. And so I really appreciate you being here. And I think the whole thing about giving away energy and giving away love and kindness, that's why we're, that's why we're here. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Fall Rise Give, where we explore stories of resilience, growth, and giving back. If you enjoyed today's episode, please visit our website at www.fallrisegive.com. Also consider subscribing to our podcast on your favorite platform and leaving us a review. Your feedback helps us to continue to bring you inspiring stories. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, every fall is a chance to rise and every rise is an opportunity to give. Until next time, keep falling, rising, and giving. This is Fall Rise Give, produced by podcastforhire.com. Thank you for listening.